I was unemployed, uh, broke, 20-something years old. And I was going up on an airline ticket to go see a mentor. Um, and I got to the airport. The airport was really crowded, super long lines. And back then, you had to wait in line and check in at a counter to get your boarding pass. You had to have a boarding pass to go through security, and you had to get it from an agent at the counter. And the line was an hour long, and I missed the flight. And I was getting more irritated and impatient by the second. And I was saying to everybody around me, am I the only one that thinks this is insane? The line's an hour long, and people are like, dude, just shut up. And we're all in the same problem. And I was like, right, but why are you okay with this? Why are you just standing there? And they're like, you're irritating us more than the line. And I was like, there has to be a better way to check in for a flight. And people are just rolling their eyes at me. Uh, but my impatience, I miss the flight. And I was like, I am never going to miss a flight again. This is ridiculous. There has to be a way to check in faster. So I went home, and that Friday was really when I started my first real startup. And I just took out a piece of paper, pencil, and sat there and said, how do I fix this so I don't have to stand in line again? And the answer is, you know, when you go to an airport today and you check in on one of those kiosks where you walk up and check yourself in, that was my first invention, basically. Uh, we created these kiosks. We got patents for them. We started selling them to airlines and airports. And today they're all over the world. And the, the company was successful. But uh, it was born out of impatience uh, more than anything else. Welcome to today's episode of Invested Success. I am so excited to bring you today's guest. This is a big episode for Invested Success. We have our first billionaire on the show today. He has done so many fascinating things. He is a best-selling author. He is a motivational speaker. He's a producer of a Grammy award-winning jazz album. He's a Hollywood film producer, and he also stars in a groundbreaking television series called Going Public, a show where viewers can invest in the startups that he mentors. And you probably may know him best from his early involvement in little-known success stories such as Priceline, UBID, and Booking.com. So for example, if you've ever used one of those kiosks at the airport that allow you to print your boarding pass so you don't have to wait in line, well, you can thank Jeff for that. And we talk about how he came up with that idea and implemented that idea in today's episode. My favorite part of today's episode is when Jeff teaches a really cool mind control trick that can help you inspire and lead people. And we talk about how to start a business, whether or not you should bootstrap or if you should take funding. Uh, and what he, he talks about some really interesting beliefs that he thinks could actually make the world a better place. So you're definitely going to get a ton out of this episode. Jeff is absolutely brilliant and full of wisdom and insight that you can apply to your everyday life. I'm so grateful to him coming on the show. I was so inspired. I think you're going to be as well. I'm hoping by spreading the knowledge of innovators, I can help you learn some really hard won lessons that I've won myself and that I'm still learning so that we can lead more successful lives. So if you want to help make this show more of what you want, be sure to visit investedsuccess.com forward slash audience survey to contribute your thoughts about how we can make the show better. Let me know what kind of guests you want, what sort of topics you want to explore. On that note, you might notice today that we ask some audience questions to Jeff, and he is blown away. They're his favorite questions of the day. And shout out to listener and audience group member Christina for asking these very smart questions that Jeff loved so much, and I loved listening to the answer. So if you want to participate and contribute questions to our guests, who include everything from billionaires to stand-up comedians to famous actors and even founders of household brands, then you're definitely going to want to join our group, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash invested success, where you can contribute audience questions and I will ask them for you live on air to our guests. And I have to say the, the questions that the group has contributed so far have been our biggest hits. Please help me welcome entrepreneur, speaker, humanitarian, author, Jeff Hoffman. Welcome, Jeff. 
I am just so excited to have you in your serial entrepreneur career. What was the first uh, love of your, your serial entrepreneurialism, as you might say? Well, you know what? It was actually nothing to do with money and nothing to do with the business. It was freedom, um, independence. Uh, I didn't actually ever know the word entrepreneur. I never used it my whole career. But even when I was a kid, I had a single mom with four kids and working multiple jobs and always stressed out trying to make ends meet. Um, and what I discovered was if I could go out and find a way, knock on a door and ask somebody if I could mow their lawn, clean their garage, take out their trash, something that they didn't want to do that I could do that they'd pay me for. What I discovered was I could achieve independence, right? Because a lot of times as kids on weekends, we'd be like, let's go to the mall and see a movie. And uh, other kids were like, I got to ask my parents for money. Uh, and I would just sit there and say, I actually mowed a couple lawns the other day. I don't have to ask anybody for anything, right? I have money. Um, and so it was the freedom of not having to stress out my mom and not bothering her. And I, I kind of liked that I that formula. You know, have some some something you want to do, right? A dream. Um, and then go out and work hard. And then it's all on you. As long as you're doing something somebody values, the world will pay you. And you'll have that independence. So I didn't care about the money per se. What I cared about was the freedom and independence. And that's what got me interested in being an entrepreneur, even though I never used that word back then. I totally agree with you there. And that would probably be the underlying theme of this entire podcast. If you if you look a little bit closer, it's one of my personal priorities and values as well. So and but you by trade and correct me if I'm wrong, were an engineer. Is that right? And you had a day job for a little while or or tried that life for a minute. Is that correct? You are absolutely right. But it's funny because I went away to uh, college. Well, first of all, that's sort of part of my entrepreneurial journey because <clears throat> I knew that getting educated in the areas, uh, the, the thing I wanted to learn, by the way, which was this back then relatively new thing called AI, uh, artificial intelligence. And I was like, whatever that is, I want to learn that. And so I, there were a limited number of schools then that, that were creating and studying artificial intelligence. And uh, really, there was maybe four good choices. And so I picked one, and that was Yale. And I wanted to go to Yale, but I came from a place where people don't go away to school, and they certainly don't go to an Ivy League school. And so the odds were low, and the support was lower, because everybody thought it was a stupid dream and a stupid idea. Um, so I worked hard and actually got into Yale, and I went there, and I wound up basically getting kicked out when I got there because I hadn't paid. I just didn't have money, and my scholarships didn't cover it. Um, but I wanted to study tech and software and AI there. I wanted to study technology there because they had that AI program. So I didn't want to leave even when they had told me to. Uh, so I started a little software company as a student the first week of college. And I wound up funding my entire college degree by myself uh, by running a software company in the basement when I wasn't doing homework uh, at college. So thing is, when I finished, I had this engineering degree in software. And, you know, the whole world tells you, go out and get a good job, get a good company so you can get a good paycheck. That is the message that parents tell kids and society tells us. And I kind of, honestly, I kind of folded, right, to that. And I said, well, that's what everybody does and everyone says. So I went and got a corporate job at a big engineering company. Uh, so I had a good job at a good company and a good paycheck, except at least I didn't have a good life because I hated my job every day. Even though I was well paid, I was just bored. And I would sit in my cubicle and stare out the window and wonder what the rest of the world was doing. So I was, I, I, and I had a lot of, you know, I guess sarcasm, cynicism about the corporate structure because we spent so much time trying to feed management and make them happy as opposed to customers in the external world. And when I would bring that up, people would say, You're wrong. Your boss controls your destiny. The customers are irrelevant. I was like, isn't that exactly backwards? And people were like, not if you want to get ahead here. And I said, well, in that case, I don't. Uh, and I will go leave and I'll go out to the world where my focus is on, you know, delighting customers, not delighting my boss per se. That is, should be the thing that delights your boss. So when I started my first company, that's the first thing I told my employees. You don't work for me. You work for them, the customers. And if they're happy, I'm happy. So don't worry about it. Um, and I was able to create 
And, and I'm saying this because all entrepreneurs should realize that one of the main reasons to be an entrepreneur, besides what you and I just talked about, freedom, um, is to create the company you wished you worked for anyway. Instead of spending month after month complaining about the place you work now, why don't you just go build the company you wish you worked at anyway? That's the beauty of entrepreneurship, and that's what I wound up being able to do because I left. So wise. I love I love that. That's really inspiring. What is the company that you wanted to work for? Like, What were all the elements, aside from obviously being very customer-focused? What is your dream company? That sounds like something, a place I would like to work, actually. Well, I have to tell you, the first part uh, was honestly about judging people by their merits. What do you bring to the world? Who are you? And what do you bring? What do you add to the world? And that is not the environment I was in. There's a reason when I speak, I never say the name of the company uh, because I, you know, I, I'm not there to cast a negative light on them. But I, I, it was not a good situation. I had a boss that I believed uh, literally ranked inputs by what you look like. If you were a white male your idea was probably good. If you were a female of any kind, it was a second-rate idea. If you were non-white, it was probably a third-rate idea. I'm not kidding. I watched the way he interacted with people. And I said, I need to work for a company where everybody is judged that it's age-blind, gender-blind, race-blind, color-blind, you know, ethnicity. I, I just want to work for a place that celebrates human beings for what they bring to the world. What are, what are, you know, what are your gifts? What are your talents? What are your contributions? And nothing else should matter. And th that thought occurred to me one day, instead of complaining about this place, why don't you just go build a company that has no such, uh, uh, you know, boundaries that everybody is treated the same and everybody's, uh, uh, future is based on their contribution, not their color or their gender. And so that was the first thing. I wanted to build that diverse and inclusive workplace where I got a broad, and by the way, as a CEO my whole life, um, you know, I always did consensus management. I listened 10 times before I ever spoke. And, and that's a mistake that leaders make because everyone's staring at you, you're the boss. So what does a boss do? If you ask a child, what does a boss do? They will tell you, well, they tell everyone else what to do. Well, therein lies the problem. If you think because you're the CEO, the founder, the manager, whatever you are, um, if you think, therefore, your job is to tell people what to do, um, you're missing the point. Uh, you know, real leaders don't build, they don't collect followers, they build leaders. Your job is to lift people up beyond you and spend time building people uh, into a better leader than you were. Um, and, and so... Those were the things I wanted to see, and I didn't see where I worked, and I said, I'll just make that company. I'll just make that be our set of rules and the way we operated our company, and it was such a pleasure uh, to be able to sort of design a culture together with the team for my first company uh, that reflected the kind of world we wanted to live in, including what you just said before, which was a really intense focus on customer. Uh, can I share with you one story about customer focus? Please okay. do. We had a, a, a big company customer. It was actually, I will say the name. Uh, it was actually Procter & Gamble at the time was a customer. So obviously a huge company. And we used to alternate monthly meetings at their headquarters in Cincinnati and then at our office and, you know, back and forth. And one month, um, the meeting was in Cincinnati, but their person was at our office working. And his name was Lee. I said, hey, Lee. He said, hey, Jeff. I said, uh, what are you doing here? Isn't there supposed to be a meeting? And he said, well, it's not today, but no. And I said, but what are you doing here this week? He said, just working. Why? And I said, well, isn't there a, a meeting up in Cincinnati? He said, no, we're not having the meeting this week. And I said, then why aren't you up there? He said, I don't understand. I said, I don't understand. And I said, why aren't you at the office? And he said, oh, my God, Jeff, I work for you. I said, wait, what? He said, I work for this company. You hired me. I said, oh, my God, I thought you worked for Procter & Gamble all this time. And he said, then I'm doing what you told me. I said, what do you mean? He said, the day you hired me, you said, don't worry about making me happy as your boss. Take care of the customer like you worked for them, and everything will work out. And so we laughed for so long about that because he did such a good job 
of representing and taking care of the customer that I thought he worked for them. I completely forgot that he was an employee of my company. That's the kind of environment we wanted to work in. So that's the company we built. Oh, I love that so much. And thank you for saying that. I, I think you really hit it on the head. I, I have experienced the same thing in corporations and the fact that you were able to pick up on that and tune into that is just so wise. And that's one of the things I love about entrepreneurs too, is that th- when they see something they don't like in the world, they go change it. And I think I heard you talk about that a little, um, you know, is, is you get irritated by things and then you want to go fix them, which is so cool. So how did that lead to some of your great uh, entrepreneurial endeavors, would you say? Well, you know, it's funny because uh, many years later, I should call and compliment my English teacher uh, who was trying to explain to us what a Shakespearean tragedy was. And I'm not sure I paid attention then, but many years later, I figured it out that that Shakespeare's definition was that uh, the the trait you have as an individual that makes you most successful is probably the trait that's going to kill you ultimately. So the exa- that's what he that's what he wrote about, and I didn't understand that. So what that means is the trait that has probably helped me the most in the business, and I'll explain with my first company, is impatience. But based on that. Impatience is what has driven me to build things and fix things because I can't stand that it doesn't work. Uh, But based on that, I will eventually step into the street in front of a bus instead of waiting for the light to change. And my impatience will be the end of me. People will say, man, couldn't he have waited three more seconds for the light to turn green? Um, Oh, I'll try to avoid that. But um, my uh, actual first uh, real startup out of school, when I left that corporate job, um, I was unemployed. Uh, broke 20 something years old and I was going I bought an airline ticket to go see a mentor um, and I got to the airport the airport was really crowded super long lines and back then you had to wait in line and check in at a counter to get your boarding pass you had to have a boarding pass to go through security and you had to get it from an agent at the counter and the line was an hour long and I missed the flight and I was getting more irritated and impatient by the second and I was saying to everybody around me, am I the only one that thinks this is insane? The line's an hour long and people are like, dude, just shut up. And we're all in the same problem. And I was like, right, but why are you okay with this? Why are you just standing there? And they're like, you're irritating us more than the line. And I was like, there has to be a better way to check in for a flight. And people are just rolling their eyes at me. Uh, but my impatience, I miss a flight. And I was like, I am never going to miss a flight again. This is ridiculous. There has to be a way to check in faster. So I went home and that Friday was really when I started my first real startup. And I just took out a piece of paper, pencil and sat there and said, how do I fix this? So I don't have to stand in line again. And the answer is, you know, when you go to an airport today and you check in on one of those kiosks where you walk up and check yourself in, that was my first invention. Basically. Uh, We created these kiosks. we got patents for them. We started selling them to airlines and airports, and today they're all over the world, and the, the company was successful. But uh, it was born out of impatience uh, more than anything else. That gives me hope because I'm one of the least patient people you'll no. ever meet. And that invention, I just need to personally thank you because I travel all the time, and it saves my life every flight. Very cool. That's such a great story. Are there any other uh, entrepreneurial endeavors that were born out of impatience that you can think of or have has, has another personality trait inspired them? Well, I would say that the other endeavors weren't so much born out of the impatience, but they wouldn't have succeeded without it, if that makes sense. That might have been born out of other situations that weren't impatience, but they got done, right? On, on my Oh, wrong way. On my wall behind me is what used to be on my door as a CEO all those years. I wrote on my door, your ideas are welcome here, but execution is worship. Um, and people would come in my office. They'd be explaining their idea to me. And you know what I'd be thinking? I'd be thinking, oh, my God, in the amount of time it took you to explain this to me, you could have built the prototype. Please leave my office. But uh, <laughs> people knew that I was impatient, because, but I was impatient because I wanted to see people get stuff done. Everybody talks all the time. That's why it says execution is worship. And very few people get it done. And the amount of time people spend talking or procrastinating, you probably could have finished it. So our impatience, honestly, uh, you know, uh, when, when people would be, I, I was kind of a, why are we ever putting off to tomorrow something we could finish now? Just finish it. 
And that was kind of the, as a leader, the drive I always had for my team. Guys, can we cancel this meeting and everybody just go do this right now? So I don't think we would have been successful without the impatience, but it wasn't necessarily the birthplace of all the ideas. I also, I just have to know, I didn't realize you were so interested in AI early on, and it's a topic that fascinates me. Are you still excited about the future of AI and where do you think that's going? Absolutely. Uh, I I think that the biggest uh, piece of it, and this is going to sound boring, uh, but, but it's true, is pattern recognition. The beauty of AI is to observe behaviors over, you know, large populations and start to be able to predict things uh, based on recognizing patterns. When you tell people this, they feel that way. When they feel that way, they do this thing. And when they do this thing, this is what happens, right? So we want AI to start being predictive. What do we need to do to get what outcome or what's going to happen if I do this, right? That's kind of people's version of the early AI is you could ask it a question. If I did this, what would happen? And and so I think it's being able to look at massive amounts of data in real time and, and sort of be predictive. Here's what's about to happen, and here's how you could shape that outcome if that's what you want to do. That's pretty exciting to me in many, many fields, um, whether it's medicine or marketing uh, of any kind. I think that it's really useful to get at a point in the world where we can uh, – start to see patterns in the bigger world around us and figure out what they mean. That, ex- that I think that's exciting. I love that. What are some of the biggest disruptions or opportunities that you're spotting in artificial intelligence right now that you kind of want to start running towards or that, that really get you fired up? Well, you know, luckily there, there are probably uh, a couple of the ones that the pandemic has pushed the innovation in as well, because one of them is learning and education, right? We, we all know that the educational system, you put 30 kids in a class, you teach them the same thing, the same way, at the same pace, that can't be the best solution for all 30 kids, right? But the flip side is you can't have 30 teachers, each one teaching one kid. We get that. However, you probably will when it's in, when it's in AI, right? That's actually observing the kid, um, exi- you know, testing the kid, talking to the kid. I, I think we'll be able to to uh, get better at education uh, using AI. I think it's a technology that will be able to interact with with a learner, not necessarily just a kid, and figure out where that learner is on the learning spectrum and, and sort of tailor the next lesson to where you at, meeting you where you are, teaching you at the pace and with the method that you best learn with uh, through, you know, that's why they call these things learning systems, right? These, these AIs, uh, they're, they're technology that learns as it goes. Um, so I think education is an exciting place. Um, the other one I like a lot for AI is healthcare. Um, in a way, if you think about it, what a doctor does is they compare recorded, med- you come in and you have a problem, a symptom. They compare recorded medical knowledge, what's in a book, and then they add that to their experience. Well, I once had a patient who came in and it turned out she had something similar and it was this. So that's great, except you've already seen probably um, IBM's Watson, right, being used as a doctor. Because while your doctor remembers 30 people that had a rash like that, uh, an AI like Watson looks at 3 million records of everybody that's ever had anything. It looks at them over a 10-year period what treatment was described, and what humans just can't do it. So AI to improve healthcare, I think, is really exciting, too. I 100% agree. I'm really excited about that as well. Do you think there's any potential downfalls as well that we should keep uh, an eye out? You know, obviously, there's a lot of dystopian future novels that, that have predicted uh, AI issues. Is there anything like that you think we should keep in mind? Yeah, they're not all wrong, right? Um, uh, you know, uh, any kind of power in the wrong hands. So as technology becomes more powerful, when it gets in the wrong hands, it's therefore potentially more capable of destruction, of causing more harm because it's more powerful. That will never change, you know, because that's unfortunately part of humanity. We'll have to continue to, to deal with that, just like, you know, blue crime got bigger and easier for, uh, you know, for cyber criminals that don't have to put a hood on, run into a bank and hope they don't get shot. They can sit in their basement with the lights off and try to steal money electronically. Um, so uh, the, the obvious part of it elevates. And the other obvious part of it, you know, is what we see now where 
Um, we don't know what the results of all this dependence on technology are going to be. What a child, a random example, a child that was raised running around outside having to dream up and create games, right? When I was a kid, we went outside and we made up games. Okay, here's what we're going to do. You guys are going to be an army and we're going to be a blank and here's the strategy and we're going to try to do this and like a game of capture the flag or whatever. But we had to do a lot of thinking on our own. And now you have kids that are just staring at a screen completely passively and waiting for it to entertain them. Uh, they're not creating it. Now, again, we're, you're, we're talking about the downside because there's an upside. Millions of people are creating using these technologies, right? But that's not what we're talking about now. The downside is you we get a generation of people so dependent on tech for their stimulation uh, that I just don't know what the down. I can't imagine. That's not having a big negative impact on the human race in a lot of ways where people are. Did you see the movie Ready Player One? Um, yes. yes. Great because, movie. Great book. Mm -hmm. Right. People have a people that have a really horrible life have a way better one in the metaverse. So they don't really want to come back to reality because their life's better in there. That's scary because it's true. All right. Uh, there'll be a lot of people that would rather have their virtual life than their real one. And so instead of trying to improve their real one, they'll just run away to the virtual one. And what we really need is more people uh, putting down the device, taking off the headset, and going out and trying to make the world a better place and help other people. I fear that we'll lose some of that in a highly tech-dependent world. So wise, so insightful. I know you spoke a bit about mentorship, that you had mentors. And I think that that's so interesting because it's so easy to think someone like you just appeared as successful as you are today, I mean, who? what were some of those early influences when you were getting started? And do you um, mentor people now, today? Yeah, so that is why I mentor. Uh, and I do it a lot. Um, probably literally almost every day, I've got at least one, uh, uh, one mentoring session. Um, at least one today. I've had about three. That's kind of my commitment to giving back. But part of it is because early on, I, in fact, did not have mentors. And at the very beginning, I would make a mistake, Elise, and I'd be like laying in the wreckage figuratively. And I was like, I just saw your cat <laughs> come up behind you. Um, <laughs> so she loves the camera. She's a kind of a drama queen. <laughs> What's her name? Her name is Mocha. So, okay, yeah, she has got three legs. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, so it was... Uh, uh, it was, you know, laying there in the wreckage and thinking, somebody knew that I should not turn left here. Somebody turned left here, crashed like I did, knew that it wasn't going to work. Where is that person that could have saved me from making this mistake? So I did have a lot of frustration then because I knew intuitively somebody's been down the road you want to go down. And you should find them and ask them what's on that road because it'll probably help you out. So that being said... Uh, later on, the first time I finally went out and got a mentor and the value that he created to add it, excuse me, to my life and to my business um, uh, was so immense that I never didn't have a mentor after that. And I remember making a commitment. It's the same one that I tell entrepreneurs when I mentor them now, when somebody says, how can I ever repay you? Uh, you know, the answer is really easy. Uh, go mentor someone else. You don't pay, repay me, you pay it forward. Um, and so that's why I do so much mentoring. Um, and that's why I ask people, uh, take time to mentor somebody somewhere because a, a, a mentorship is so important. And it's not just a business thing, right? A mentorship is much more holistic. As a matter of fact, people ask me frequently, at least they say, how do I pick a mentor? And they're like, let, let's say you're, you're building something in the airline industry. People tell them, find someone that was in the airline industry. No. My advice to finding the best mentor is to find somebody, not necessarily from the industry you're in, but find somebody that you want to be like when you grow up. Find somebody that you admire 360. Man, someday I, I want to be like her when I grow up. That person is who you should go to for mentoring because... The industry knowledge, how does the airline back office work, that kind of stuff, you can read in a book. But the real valuable advice that you get from a mentor on how to lead your life, how to be a leader, how to manage conflict, right? how to present ideas, 
all these things, how to handle stress, how to be uh, time efficient, all those things, those are but those are the things, the soft skills that you want to learn from someone whose life you admire, not just the industry that they were in. So, yeah, once I found me- my first mentors, it was so valuable to me. I, I pledged uh, to to try to return that favor. So riveting. Uh, what were some of those crazy things that they tuned in and helped you out with? Can you think of anything like specific? Oh, yeah. Entrepreneurial, small business landscape, whatever you want to call it, the world is littered with brilliant ideas that nobody ever saw. And nobody ever saw them because the person presenting them didn't know how to present them to the world. So no one understood or no one funded or no one joined you to help build it. And and just because your idea was brilliant, your presentation was so bad. The flip side is true. There have been people that, um, that you know, they've drawn people to them for a cause that's not even good, that people wind up saying, "What? How did I get here? You got here because the story was so compelling, you couldn't help yourself." Right? I remember thinking that once when I was excited for weeks for a movie release, and so excited that I waited online a long line on a Friday night with my friends and a bunch of people to see it the night it came out, and spent all that money and got in the theater, and the movie was crap. And I was like, "Wait a minute, this this sucks. What was? How was I so excited about this?" And I was like, because they presented the idea so well. Uh, pretty, you know, could, congratulations to somebody. So I am my first mentor. And he says, uh, let me see your pitch. I said, I'm going to pitch this idea. I need to get customers to pitch them. I need to get employees and I need to get investors. So I got to pitch my idea. He said, let me see your pitch. So I pitched it and he handed me a pen. And I had printed the, the PowerPoint as well. And he handed me the printed copy and he handed me a pen. And he said, uh, I want you to go to each slide and I want you to cross out 50% of the words on every slide. You pick them. You have to cross off 50% of the words on each slide, whatever half you want. And I was like, wow, okay, I'll do that. And he said, now, read it to me again. I said, okay. He said, did you deliver the same message? I said, yeah, still got the point across. He said, fine, do it again. So I crossed off half the words again, and he said, uh, say it to me again. And he said, did I still get the point? And I said, yeah. He said, are you starting to notice you didn't need any of those words? And so I did that until I got to a version where we both laughed. I said, now it's just nonsense. And he said, correct. Back up one version, and that's how you pitch an idea. Quit, quit. You know, there's a famous Mark Twain quote that he wrote in a letter to a friend of his. He wrote a really long letter, and in the end, he said, I, wouldn't, I would have written you a much shorter letter if I'd had more time. And I actually like that because it sounds counterintuitive, but Mark Twain's point was right. Being clear and succinct is a hard. It's a skill, and it takes a lot of thought. So my boss said more, my mentor, excuse me, said way more thought, way less words. So that when you do make a point, people get it, and they say, wow. Totally understood. I think that helped me because over the years, uh, we were able to present ideas effectively. People would come back and say, man, you guys gave the best presentation we've ever seen. And we were the ones getting media coverage or customers or funding along the way. None of that probably happens for me without that mentor. That's how important mentors are in changing your life. Um, Each one of them, if you have more than one, uh, teaches you something that they knew that you didn't uh, that enhances your tool set. Genius. And it's, I'm so impressed that you have as many mentees as you, as you do. It's Thank very you. cool. Yes. Um, okay. So we talked about other soft skills. You touched upon leadership, time management, stress management, things I'm sure you've dealt with a lot. How, what would be some, some tips that you've picked up along the way that you can recommend to entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs on managing those things? Yeah, so one of them we already said, which was, you know, listening many times before you speak, uh, collecting and realizing that a leader's job is not just telling people what to do. A leader's job is absorbing data from as many diverse sources as you can and then synthesizing that into the best overall idea. And then the next part of your job is making people think it was their idea, right? When you just tell people what to do, it's way less engaging. 
then what, that's why I said that's why you're building up their leadership skills, not just telling them to follow you and do what you say. So when I would work with people and sort of nurture them and nudge them till they came to the same conclusion, and then I would say, wow, that's a brilliant idea. Let's do that. Actually, it was my idea in the first place, but I never said that. What I'd do is I'd walk them through a process of going through the data and the options and how could what could we do and how could we do it. And at the end, I'd say, even though I was steering this a little bit, I was gently nudging them down that path to the point where I'd say, okay, well, now what do you think? And they'd say, I don't know. I think maybe we should do this. And I would say, wow, that's brilliant. Let's do your idea. And they never knew it was my idea. And they were way more engaged because they thought of it. And they were way more proud. And they were also way more likely to come up with a good idea next time because they would say to me, that process you walked me through, I'm going to do that myself this time. So I was building leaders and I was building engagement. That's what you've got to do uh, to be a good entrepreneur and to be a good uh, leader. And to be a good entrepreneur, you need to surround yourself with people smarter than you. Uh, and, you know, uh, attracting people smarter than you uh, requires checking your ego at the door and list- actually listening to them instead of acting like you're smarter than them or thinking that you are. Um, those are things that I did not know along the way going in. But, you know, now I, I have the luxury of being able to look back over my career and say, what actually worked? Uh, and so these are things that work when I look back at it. I think that may be the wisest thing I've ever heard on this podcast. I love that idea. Is there some kind of book that can teach you how to coach people into thinking it's their idea? Because I want to do that. Um. Wow. Let me ask around. I don't know of one offhand. That's a super good question. Um, you know, I spent years just sort of developing that myself uh, because I watched how much more powerful it was than telling people what to do. But I don't know if anybody listening uh, when this is posted knows, please make sure to put that in the comments because I'm curious too. I'll look around. I think I've heard of one, but I, yeah, I love that. Such great advice. So is there anything that you've encountered in your very successful career that completely was a big paradigm shift that changed your mind completely 180 degrees? Or is there like a common belief out there that you are, you know, have a completely different take on that, that maybe we should hear about? Um, I don't know if it was 180 degrees. Maybe it was, and I've touched on it a little bit just a minute ago. Uh, but, you know, the, the sort of conventional wisdom of a leader, like I said, is the person that's telling people what to do. And I think that for success started for me when I realized that a, a leader's real job is to find people smarter than you and then get out of their way. Um, And that was a paradigm shift for me because I literally started scheduling time. I spent less time actually running the company and I spent more days out of my office looking for people smarter than me. That is a paradigm shift, right? What's your job? I'm the CEO. I got to run the business. What's your job? I'm the guy that finds the smart people and lets them run the business. That was a big thought, you know, uh, uh, you know, plate shift in thought for me. Um, when I started doing that, in fact, I'll tell you really quickly kind of a story. I wrote an article once on this for Inc. Magazine. Um, it's still out there on Inc.com if someone wants to read the whole article. But I, 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 the paradigm shift for me, I was writing about it in leadership, and the article is called uh, Hire the Best and Pick Up Their Laundry. And the story, at least, was that I was on the road and my team um, called me and they said, man, we found this 20 year old whiz kid developer. And I was like, you don't need my permission. Just hire him. Right. And they're like, he's the smartest developer we've ever met. I said, hire him. So I get back in town. I spend the morning, um, looking at the kid's work at what he's the new product he's designed. And at lunch, I go down the hall and into the conference room where they're all working. Well, this 20 year old kid doesn't know I'm the CEO. He doesn't know I own the company. He doesn't know who I am. We have, we've never met. And I walk into the conference room and everyone's like, Oh, hey, Jeff. And I said, hey, can I get you guys anything? The point was they were working through lunch and I was going to order food. But this kid who doesn't know I own the company or anything turns, glances over his shoulder because he's busy. And he goes, hey, would you go get my dry cleaning? Well, everybody in the room, like the air sucked out of the room. And they're all like, oh, my God, this poor kid. He just stepped in it, right? That's the CEO. And he told me to get his dry cleaning. 
And they're all waiting to hear what I'm going to say. Uh, and I, I said, sure, where is, where's the ticket? And he said, it's on my chair. And so I left. A few minutes later, a little bit later, I'm outside. And my two vice presidents come running out. Oh, my God, please don't fire him. We're so sorry. He didn't know who you were. And I was like, well, wait, why would I fire that kid? And they're like, because he asked you to go get his dry cleaning. He probably offended you. I said, I'm not going to fire him. And I said, why did you think I was going to fire him? And they said, well, because you're so mad. I said, why do you guys think I'm mad? And they said, because you left the building. I said, that's not why I left the building. And they said, why are you in the parking lot? I said, we're going to pick up the kid's dry cleaning. And they said, you're going to pick up that kid's dry cleaning? I said, that kid's the most brilliant designer I've ever seen in my entire life. The product he is building is going to triple our revenues and probably win awards. And at least we won the uh, Internet Commerce Expo in Silicon Valley that year for the best new online product. And I got to fly out there and get the award for it because of this kid. Um, so I said to them, not only am I picking up this kid's dry cleaning, but if you guys need me later, I'm going to be out back washing his car. Um, and <laughs> Everybody got the point. That was a paradigm shift for me. My job is to go find people like that and get out of their way, not to stand in the front and tell everybody what to do. Changed my life as a leader. Ah, that's an incredible story. That's really compelling and very, uh, very cool of you to handle it that way. How do you uh, spot talent? How do you know? Because I know that's something a lot of entrepreneurs deal with is is finding the right match. Absolutely, yeah, and 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 I think the answer to that has nothing to do with their resume or their, quote, skills. It's all culture. Our, our employee matching, it, first of all, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something else that wasn't conventional wisdom when I started as running businesses, um, which is uh, it's better to hire six rock stars than 15 average people. What people tend to do, traditional wisdom is, if I have $100 to hire people, if I can get people for 20 bucks each, I could hire five people. So try to talk. Try to find people that will accept a twenty dollars salary and get five of them. That's conventional wisdom. What I learned through trial and error is hire two fifty dollar rock stars, and everyone will say, "Oh my God, you're paying her fifty dollars when you could get people for twenty. She, those two rock stars, will far outperform a dozen, let alone five, average people. You can't build greatness on the backs of of mediocre, and so. Uh, finding those rock stars is key. And it's better, to, again, to have a smaller team but spend your money on rock stars than on average, than have more people, but they're too close to the average. How do you get rock stars? Culture matters to them. Experiences matter to them. Values matter to them. Because by definition, if they're a rock star, they're already well paid and they could work anywhere they want because everybody wants them. So the salary alone, salary matters, money matters. That's not enough, right? They know they'll always get paid because they're rock stars. What they want is a is something deeper, especially the next generation of workers. Um, they want to work for a company that has values, a company that cares, a company that actually lives its values. They want to have experiences, not just paychecks. They want to grow as human beings, not just as engineers or accountants. So all that is part of creating a culture at your place that draws people. They don't come there just for the paycheck. They come there because it's a really cool place to work with really cool people that I want to be around. I think that's the, the most important key. I agree with you 100%. And that's been the case for me as well when I've been an employee. So, so if someone's looking to become an entrepreneur, but they, you know, maybe they have an idea, what should they do next? Because I know it can feel really overwhelming and daunting to do something like overturn a travel industry and implement printable boarding passes. How do you even begin doing something like that? Yeah, I think that, you know, it's funny because uh, I was on this TV show with these CEOs and uh, the host said, as leaders, what's the first thing you do when you have a good idea like that of something you want to do? And all of them said, I get the team and we go in the conference room. And I said, I get my keys and I go to the parking lot. And she's like, why is that? Um, and the answer to your question is, as soon as you have an idea, the last place you need to be is your office. Um, the place you need to be is wherever the end of the food chain is. If you are building a product and you think housewives would use it, get the heck out of your office. Go into somebody's kitchen. Um, 
find a housewife and say, excuse me, may I ask you some questions? Would you use this thing? Would you pay for this thing? What do you like? What do you not like? Um, so I think that the, the place that people come to too late is the actual end user talking directly to the customer. And I don't mean, you know, we, this whole movement started many years ago about MVPs. Go create a minimally viable product. If you have not talked to 200 housewives before you create the MVP, you're already on a bad path. So I didn't do that. I didn't go create an MVP and push it out there first. I would always leave. Even during the Priceline days, uh, we made some trips where we went to grocery stores and pretended jeans and pretended we were shopping. So we could just chat with people in the grocery store, chat with moms who were planning family vacations and chat with them about travel, stuff like that. So uh, that is the first thing you should do is leave and go out in the world, go find the people that you think are going to fall in love with your product, buy it and pay for it. And then don't pitch them. Don't wear a T-shirt that says the name of your company. Right. What I did was I, I. Change out of my business clothes into jeans and tennis shoes, and I went to the grocery store in the morning, and I got a cart, and I wandered to the produce section, pretended I was just shopping, and casually chatted with mom about the plans for the family vacation, so I could figure out what was actually in her head. Spend more time out of your office in the world, talking to the end user in a non-sales way to just understand what they value and how they operate. That I think was key to our success. Is we didn't do, you know, customer discovery. We really did customer intimacy. We were way deeper. We spent a day in the life of our customers, so we really understood what their life looked like. Genius. I love that. That sounds great. And did I just have to ask, because I do this a lot when I start my own businesses, is there a time when they ever got weirded out, or have you ever put certain um, personas in place so that they don't think it's strange that somebody at the grocery store is asking them all these questions? Yeah. Did you ever deal with that? Okay, so I'll tell you a good one. Um, I was researching travel, and I was in a grocery store, and I was chatting with a woman, and she just suddenly turned and walked away. And uh, I was like, um, okay. <laughs> so I started walking my cart down the aisle, and a, uh, uh, all of a sudden, this woman came back, and she came back with s- store security and a police officer. And they said, excuse me, sir, is there a problem here? I was like, no, I'm just uh, shopping. And they're like, well, according to this lady, uh, you asked her if she would go to New York with you. And I said, okay, I did not ask you to go to New York with me. And the cop is like, okay, what did you ask her? And I said, I just asked her if she was going to travel to New York. How would she handle her travel? How would she go? And the police officer said, okay, that's even weirder. You're going to need to leave the store and never come back. So they just walked me out of the store like I was some kind of creep. And I just left laughing. So, yes, it doesn't always work. But if you walk up to somebody and say, I'm building a travel company, may I ask you for suit questions? That's a totally different dynamic. Uh, you, you, you have to, you just get better. The answer to your question is you just get better at it as you do this, right? <laughs> the more times that I uh, was out talking to people. Um, I, I was looking at an ed- educational project once, and I, it was for fourth graders. And I wanted to, to hear how fourth graders talk and chat with them and see how they think. And I noticed I called some schools, and one of the schools, I did not have a fourth grader. But one of the schools said, we like people in the community to come read to the kids. And I said, is it uh, okay that I'm not one of the parents? They said, yeah, because we still want uh, just community leaders who care about the children in their community. So I came and read to fourth graders, but then I said, may I stay for lunch and recess? And they said, sure. So in recess, I sat on the ground, on the playground with the fourth graders in the middle of them all and just listened and do the questions they asked me. The, uh, the, uh, I asked them questions. It was nothing you would ever get from market research in a survey, because if there were any other adults or teachers around, uh, these kids would have never given you that information. Um, so yeah, you gotta, you gotta constantly refine the process because it does go wrong sometimes. I am so actually relieved to hear I'm not the only one that has like scared people with my, cause I love asking questions. You probably noticed, <laughs> but yeah, that's a yes. great treat to have. Oh, well, good. I'm glad. Yeah. You have to, if you're an entrepreneur, it's, it's so important. Uh, empathy is really key as well. So. Uh, yeah. 
I love that. And then in terms of entrepreneurship, are you a fan of funding or bootstrapping or some combination of the both? Like what advice would you give to somebody kind of starting out um, in how they kind of put their energy in, in getting something started? So that is an absolutely wonderful question. And I think that the investor community has done a disservice to entrepreneurs. Investors don't let make money until they find, invest it. So they need you to ask for an investment. They need to move their money. Uh, so they push you to go look for investors. The truth is, I believe you should bootstrap until you literally can't breathe anymore. I don't like the idea. Uh, so many people go go so early to raise money that it makes them, they start to lose their innovative edge because they think money is going to solve all their problems, right? When you're broke, you got to get pretty clever. Uh, when you have too much funding, you tend to get a little bit lazier. Um, so, you know, that's why they say, uh, you know, uh, uh, about uh, uh, necessity being the mother of invention and hunger, right? Driving innovation because you don't have another solution. You better figure this out. When you have, uh, I've been in companies I walked through where everybody was kind of complacent and kind of jokingly said under my breath, un- overfunded because they don't seem to be worried about anything. And when you're a startup, you should be worried in a healthy worry. You know what I mean, right? You should be pushing and innovating and creating. And if you just have too much funding, and so people use it as a crutch to stop innovating, but they also use it at least as an excuse to stop building stuff in the first place. Where's your prototype? Well, as soon as we get funding, we'll build one. And I was like, well, why don't you just scrap together what you can? So my advice to people is to make a list before you go get funding. Make a list of all the tasks that will have to be performed for your company to be successful. Then go back to that list and cross off all of the ones that you can't do without funding and circle all the ones that you could do right now. The point is, you make this list of all the things that your company needs to succeed, and then you go back through, and you uh, circle all the ones that you could do without somebody else's money. Do all of those before you go ask anybody for funding. And the difference is, by the time you get to the funding sources, they say, wow, you did, you know, I've literally had a day where back-to-back entrepreneurs, somebody, I said, you got a prototype? And they said, no, if you give me some money, I'll build one. And I was like, well, it doesn't cost that much to build a prototype. And they said, well, just fund me. And I was like, well, if I saw a prototype, I'd be a little more motivated. And I said, all right, well, show me the wireframes. And they said, well, well, as soon as you fund me, I'll draw some wireframes. I said, it takes a pencil. Take out a pencil and a piece of paper and just draw it. And he said, I'll do that as soon as I get funded. And I was like, unbelievable. Then I had another entrepreneur, literally the next day, who at the end of the pitch, actually asked me if he could borrow $40. I said, you don't have gas to get home? He said, it's not that. And I said, what? And he said, my girlfriend told me if I don't take out take her out to dinner by Friday, she's leaving me. And he said, I poured my heart and soul into this business. I don't have money to take her out to dinner. Can you just loan me enough money to buy her dinner? Um, what entrepreneur do you think was more impressive for me? Who do you think I want to give money to? The guy that is so focused on getting things done or the person that says, I'm not even going to pick up a pencil until you fund me. So bootstrap as far as you can possibly bootstrap, and it will make your process. You'll have investors that say, wow, I can't believe you did all that stuff without any money. Imagine that and that you can say, yeah, imagine what I could do if I was funded, um, as opposed to saying, I'll show you what I can do just as soon as I get some money, which is what too many people ask or do I mean genius do you have an example of when you did you ever bootstrap so so much that it hurts or have you been uh, lucky enough to kind of get funny and right on the cusp or no, how did you approach that no we most definitely early on were uh, uh, bootstrapping hard uh, uh, you know uh, uh, I, I am not a proponent I don't like it when somebody says, all my credit cards are maxed. My house is on the line. I mortgaged my house. I am hoping you don't have to do that, right? Um, what, what I'd rather you do is try to find a way to get the same task done for less money instead of putting yourself at risk. I, I respect when people are willing to do that 
But I'm not telling people to do that ever, right? I don't want you to be so stressed because you lose your house if this idea doesn't work. Um, but but being as scrappy as you can, right? I had times in my life where I was looking through, I pill, picked up the couch pillow looking for coins uh, so I could get something for dinner. Um, and I every dime I had, I was originally putting into my startup. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it's tough to be in that situation. And I've been in it where, and then we, I've also been through failure, right? We had some companies that uh, customers didn't like it anyway. So I actually had a company that I took investor money for. And when I realized it was going to fail, I sent the rest of their money back, uh, which the investor was uh, a little blown away. He said, wait, in the history of every investment we've ever done, no one ever sent the money back. And I said, well, I can see now this one's not going to work. All the real world data I've collected says I was just wrong. I feel horrible. I'm depressed. I'll get over it. But right now it's a tragedy because I wasted some of your money. But there's no reason for me to spend all of it. So here, take the rest back. And uh, his reaction was something I never anticipated um, uh, that I just said, look, I already know it's going to fail. So I guess my point there is making sure that you're honest with yourself when it's not working, recognizing what failure looks like and saying, look, look in the mirror and say, I was wrong. OK, get over it. Check your ego at the door. It's not working. I'm going to walk away. So I guess the reason that even though I was very financially stressed, I didn't wind up putting my entire life and everyone around me at risk was because I quit and shut it down and accepted that I was wrong way before I got there. And the difference is I deal with a lot of entrepreneurs today. The idea is not working and they spend their own personal savings. The idea is not working. So the team pulls their money. The idea is not working. So they ask their family and friends. The idea is not working, so no one else will give them money, so now they mortgage their house and their credit cards and sell their car. The point is they get in this horrible spot because uh, they pretended that they didn't hear what the world was telling them. Uh, when the data in the world is saying, this one just ain't going to work, check your ego and move on. Fail fast. Uh, the shame in life is not in failing, right? It's in not trying in the first place. Try something and recognize it. Spend a day crying because uh, it hurts, but get over it. And I so agree with you. I think failure, if if such concept does exist, is is really key. But I I was just talking uh, to somebody about that because as an entrepreneur, it can be really hard. There's obvious yeah. failures, and then there's those businesses that are kind of just limping along, and you kind of want to kill them, but you don't, you know. But it's kind of working. How how are you able to really know? Do you have any metrics that you use to define a failure and when to just like cut the cord? Um, I do an exercise uh, that I would do with my companies on every January one, I would take out two sheets of paper and on one, I would write down what success looks like as quantifiably as you can. You know, you use the right word metrics. Success will be if at the end of the year, our revenues are X dollars. We have Y number of customers. We have Z number of employees. We have whatever. We're at product version three. As quantifiably and measure, measurably as you can, write down what success looks like. But a lot of people do that. Here's what no, but what they don't do that I started doing. <laughs> I took out another sheet of paper and I wrote down what failure looks like. And I said, if December 31st comes and we only have three customers and our revenues are only this and we've only, I literally drew failure. And you know what else I used to do, Lisa? I used to make all my stakeholders, meaning employees, investors, everyone who cares about the company, sign that sheet of paper. And my employees said, what are we doing? And I said, you are pre-firing yourself. If we get to December and the numbers look like this, I should not have to go tell you. You should be packing up your stuff in your car because we were wrong and we need to do something else and stop wasting our time and investors' money. So defining failure as well as success and agreeing on it and saying, if we get to the end of, usually I do this a year at a time and our company looks like this, there's nothing to discuss. We're not doing this another year. We already agreed rationally that this is failure. And what happens is I see people say, well, let's just give it another year. I'm not sure if it's working. Let's just give it another year. I don't buy that. After two years, you have an idea if this thing is starting to work or not. 
And if it and you should be able to define some metrics to say this is what success looks like and this is what failure looks like, and accept those results. Uh, but you got to know them before the start of the year, not the end. If you could wave a magic wand to make the whole world understand one universal truth, is there anything that you would would want them all to believe or, or know? Yes, I've never been asked that question. I absolutely love that you asked that. I think the the answer to that question is that it's never about you and it never was. Um, and I think that that is a paradigm shifting realization as well. Because everybody's kind of, and I'm overstating this, it's not everybody, clearly. Uh, but most people are me, me, me. What's in it for me? Uh, they're doing what they're doing for them. And their story is about them. And their dream is about them. And their day is kind of about them. And their happiness is about them. They're happy when they get what they want. Instead of realizing how much, uh, I don't even have the right words for it, but how much more powerfully happy you'd be watching other people, the people you care about, get what they want. That is way more fulfilling than getting what you want. But it doesn't happen if you're spending your life trying to get what you want instead of trying to help other people get where they were going and get what, get what they want out of life. So I think if people would realize it's not about you, it was never about you, and if you spend your time making a lot more of your life about someone else, you wind up being way happier and way more fulfilled. I think that that relentless pursuit of, you know, self gratification is the cause of so many problems in the world. And uh, and so that's it. You asked a really cool question. I, I love that you asked that. You've never been oh, asked that oh wow! Well, thank you. Um, I yeah, your answer was beyond remarkable. So thank you so much. How do you select mentors? I I do have to ask that one. How does one become one of your mentees? Oh, okay. So for me, that is uh, a, a really simple answer. And the answer is the ripple effect. Um, what I want to know is uh, what would you do if you are successful? How will you use your success to make other people's lives better? So I am not really focused on companies and focused on people, but the people that I choose it's not just, is this a good business idea? Is she going to make money? Is she going to be successful? It's way past that. The question I'm asking is, if she becomes successful, and hopefully I helped in some tiny little way, but if that person achieves success, will they use that platform? Will they use their resources to do something bigger than them? Will you make other people's lives better because you were successful? So one of my... Uh, friends and a person that I also do business and charity stuff with is Pitbull, the singer. And, you know, Pitbull has already impacted thousands of families and, and uh, children's lives who really need it. He builds schools. And, you know, the reason uh, that we're such good friends and the reason I love the guy so much is because he realized that even though it's him on stage singing and thousands of people are cheering for Pitbull or whatever, what one of the first things he told me early on was he goes on stage to be able to enable himself to build schools for all those kids that need the help, right? He understands that the stage is just the place that puts him in a position to save families. It's not, it's not the other way around. He's not soaking in the adoring fans and saying, look at me, I'm so great. He's actually saying, man, I'm so blessed that I get to do this job because when I'm done with the stage, I can go build another school. That is the that is kind of the characteristic set of the people that I love investing time in uh, and trying to mentor and help because I fundamentally believe they'll impact other people's lives positively as kind of a pay it forward later, whether it's consciously or subconsciously. That's much more important to me than your idea. I think that's wonderful. So your mentee program is almost like a philanthropic effort. It is. I don't really say that to them out loud. It's just my criteria is, again, if you become successful, uh, what will you do with it, with your life? Not just your money, your time, your influence, your whatever you have. Any resources you have, uh, I, why would I want to help somebody become successful that I look at? Someone says, hey, thanks for helping me get here. Uh, now I have three yachts, not one, right? And I'm like, boy, that was worth my time. Uh, this person, you know, and that's happened. 
in the world, that there are people have every right to do that. It's your success. You can do what you want with it. But I feel so much better. Uh, like, for example, there is a, uh, was a young girl in Peru that mm-hmm. I mentored for years and helping her trying to set up a school to teach uh, poor Peruvian girls how to write code. And today there are now probably not hundreds anymore, probably thousands of young girls across South America who have real jobs and homes to live in in the city because they learned to write code from one of her seven schools now. And when I started working with her, it was just her and zero schools um, and zero kids. And so that's an example of looking back and saying every second I spent with this girl was worth it because look at all the people whose lives are better because of what she built. Do you have any projects or philanthropic efforts that you have chosen to invest in that you would like to spotlight? Absolutely. Um, I uh, created uh, my own uh, youth charity uh, that we now run it ourselves. It's called World Youth Horizons. The website is worldyouthhorizons.com. Um, <clears throat> we are doing everything from building schools, building orphanages, taking kids from the inner cities on trips so that they can see what's possible in the world, showing them career opportunities. Um, we have a lot of programs uh, that we do uh, in the U.S. and Africa and other places. But, yeah, the goal of it is to level the playing field and give children around the world, including in the U.S., an opportunity, a chance to better themselves, mostly through education, and have a chance to build a better life than the one they have and to be able to go back and take care of the people they wish they could take care of. I had a young man in Senegal tell me, I wish I could take care of all 20 families in my village, give them all jobs, give them all food, give them all uh, you know, homes to live in instead of houses that they packed out of mud. Um, and, you know, he, he uh, to be able to do anything to help put a person like that in a position to be able to help those people. So World Youth Horizons is our children's charity. Uh, it's, it's what we spend a lot of time on uh, trying to give children a chance in the world. So that's, that's the one that I'm most, most passionate about, and most proud of. Thank you for giving me a chance to mention it. Absolutely. I would actually love to get involved and help in some way. And I'm sure some of our listeners would be interested as well. What's the best way that, that we can help contribute? Well, I'll tell you, you can find this online. Anyway, my email is just jeff at jeffhoffman.com. But on the website of World Youth Horizons, there's a button that says get involved. And if you click that, it goes directly to our team uh, because we need help from a lot of people in a lot of ways. They will reach out to you. I would love to hear from people. And of course, um, anybody that wants to donate, needless to say, every dollar impacts a child's life somewhere. So feel free to do that. But if not, um, we absolutely need uh, people's uh, time and talents um, to help mentor these children and help us organize these efforts. It's all volunteer. So I would love it if people go on there and click the I to get involved. But Elise, thank you so much for having me today. Thank you so much, Jeff. I learned so much today. You really, truly are a wonderful role model. So thank you for coming on. It really means the world. I can't thank you enough. All right. We will talk again soon. All right. Have a great day. Jeff, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was an absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you for contributing such wise advice and thank you for everything you're doing to um, make the world a better place. I love that your heart lies with these philanthropic efforts and I hope that some of our listeners are inspired to get involved on this important mission that you're bringing to the world. What was your favorite part of the show? Let us know in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube or leave a review on iTunes. And remember to subscribe wherever you're listening. You might have also noticed that our audience contributed and participated in asking questions to this guest today. I am so thrilled that he loved your questions. And that's why I want to have you as a part of the community. So check out facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash invested success and you can join our community and you can ask 
questions to the next guests that are coming up this season, which include stand-up comedians, more billionaires, millionaires, business founders of household brands, really famous actors. We've got it all on this show. It's a smattering of super interesting people. So you're definitely going to want to pick their brain and ask questions, and I want to channel those questions for you. So thank you for participating and joining our group. It's a pleasure to have you. As always, I really, really, really appreciate you tuning in week after week. The most important part of this show is you, the audience, and the listeners. And I, the only reason I do this is because I want to help you become an invested success story. So tell me how this show has helped you. Drop me an email at hello at investedsuccess.com. Anytime I want to hear from you about how this show is resonating, how it's made your life better, um, or what you would improve and what you want more of. I love hearing from my readers. I respond to every email. So please connect with me and drop me a line anytime. As always, this is Elise Walsh with Invested Success signing off and I will see you next time.